Welcome everyone to another episode of Your Soul Purpose. I'm your host, Dr. John Filo, and I am very excited to have Tom Campbell join me on the podcast once again. Uh, We delve into a number of interesting topics, one being the difference between intellect and emotion as a mode of expression for consciousness, and how finding the balance between thought and intuition can actually raise our consciousness into love and into the service of others, or as Freud would describe the realm of the superego. We talk about the path of enlightenment and the experience of touching that euphoric, blissful state during meditation, that connection or oneness with all that is. And we also touch on the idea of cultural reincarnation, how jumping or crossing cultures uh, enriches your soul DNA and may be also indicative of an elevated uh, level of consciousness. And for those of you left-brainers out there, an interesting question on time as it pertains to the larger consciousness system versus the PMR, how time or delta T may be adjusted to fast forward evolution. It was, as it always is, a rich and insightful discussion, and I think you'll all enjoy this one. Here is Tom Campbell on your soul purpose. Is the the idea of intellect versus emotion, understanding it through the context of uh, the construct of MBT, what uh, specifically would you say determines whether a free awareness unit is expressing dominance in one or the other? Or is it simply a filter or the constraints of the avatar itself that determine that form of expression? Or is it something that's inherent in the nature of of the IOC? Well, emotion is just another form of expression. Okay, You you can express in terms of words and language. Uh, You can express in terms of gestures. And um, you know body body positions, and you can express in terms of emotions. So it's just another output, if you will. It's another output type, another mode, another expression mode that the uh, that the individuated unit of consciousness or the free will awareness unit can use to express itself. Now emotions are very different than the intellect. Uh, the emotions come right from the being level when you get a feeling that's your feeling you know it's it's that is a representation of how you feel at your being level at the core of you um your intellect tends to not be so honest your intellect tends to think thoughts that are consistent with its beliefs consistent with its ego and fears it tends to uh, whitewash things that you'd rather not look at. You know, it tends to ignore things that uh, are uh, counter to the way you think they should be. So it's it's a, a much less um, connected to the being level sort of sort of thing. Okay. Now, an interesting thing here, particularly for those that are in psychology, is that you know Freud talks about a subconscious. You have a conscious mind and that's the ego, then you have a subconscious, which is below that, you're just not aware of it. You get things happening there and and they bubble up into the conscious mind some, but basically it's a place where you're unaware. Then they have the, uh, and I guess the id lives in there, you know, your your sexual uh, and your hunger and all the basic instinctual kind of things we come with being a human animal live in there. And then at the the top end is the uh, superego, which is uh, that uh, part of you that's not about self, but about other. It's that uh, bigger picture. Okay, well, that, sub, that subconscious that we're not aware of really is not fundamental. It's not a fundamental part of consciousness. Uh, it's there because there are things that you just as soon not deal with, things that are not at, at a level where you could deal with them well. They're... They're the things you'd rather just keep under the rug. Those things end up in our subconscious. So there's a lot of feelings down there in that, in that subconscious level, a lot of the being level. When you get rid of fear and get rid of the ego and the belief that goes with the fear, you don't have a subconscious. You're aware, you're aware of everything. You're a whole 
unit that is aware. You're aware of your, your hunger and your sexuality and, you know, your needs, your drives, your wants. All of that is, you're aware of that. It's not mm. hidden from you. Your feelings, your emotions, none of that is hidden from you. So basically, the subconscious becomes something that's kind of a, a, a pathological result of the fear and the ego and beliefs that, uh, that people have. So when we separate the, the intellect, which is what we, you know, who we think we are, who we'd like to be, the way we think we should respond, uh, from, the, from the feelings, which are exactly what we are, you know, nobody says, oh, I think I should be angry now. You know, that doesn't happen. Anger just, just, you know, roars up out of you. It's not that you have decided that you're going to get angry. Um, so if you, if you want to have a good idea of where you are on this consciousness evolution scale, pay attention to your feelings. Also, pay attention to your dreams. Dreams are the same way. In your dreams, well, regular dreams, dreams that are not lucid, um, your intellect is not in charge. You're not thinking before you act. You're acting right out of the being level. So the way you interact, the choices you make in dreams are really the way you are. That's you at the being level. Because now it's a lucid dream. Now you're back to the intellect's in charge. But regular dreams uh, are much like emotions in that sense. They come straight out of the, out of the being level. Now, there's a little confusion between the intellectual level and the being level often because, you know, we talk about the intellectual level as, as your thinking, your rational part, but that's not really true. You're, you can have, when you get rid of fear and you have no ego and beliefs, you still can think, you know, it's not like, well, your intellectual level, that's you know, making up stories and justifying everything, you know. It, you let go of using it for that. It's no longer used to justify and to make up stories that make you feel better and so on. But you still have a cognitive function. You still have, you know, the ability to think and analyze and, and weigh and consider and judge and all those things are there. They're just lacking the ego and the fear. So at that point, you're thinking out of your being level as well. You see, your, your intellectual part is part of your being. Now you are just one level. You're all just one thing. You're a being. And part of that being is cognitive function. And part of it is emotional function. Part of it is uh, instincts, you know, the sexuality, the other things. That's all one whole being. And you're it. And it's all in touch with itself. So that's sort of a, a little walk through psychology, mm -hmm. being level, you know, so uh, intellectual the, level. Does the data, I mean, if consciousness is a data stream, so the data stream has a quality that can evoke emotion and has also has a quality that can evoke intellect, is what you're saying? Yeah, well, I don't know that it evoked intellect. The intellect can be brought to bear on it. But yes, it has qualities that, that uh, evoke emotion. You know, And when we uh, play video games, it's the same way, right? We get, we get a data stream from the computer and we will see something that you know, touches us emotionally on the computer screen, and we immediately have emotions to connect to that. So there's part of our natural expression of our of who we are, of what we are, that comes out as emotional. It comes out in a feeling space rather than in intellectual space. So we function in both of those modes simultaneously. You know, we, we think about it, oh, what a sad thing. You know, maybe that's our intellect. But then we emotionally connect to it, in a feeling space. So we operate in both the thinking and the feeling simultaneously, just different modes. And yes, those, those pixels on the screen, we interpret those to be something that we think about being sad and that we feel sad about at the same time. Or we have empathy. See, now empathy is a connection to another person in a feeling space, not so much in an intellectual space. You, I guess you can have intellectual empathy where you'd look at somebody and then you'd consider their situation and intellectually um, you know feel some kind of thing for them but see again feel some kind of thing for them. empathy is really out of your feeling space it's caring about another so all of those become just one thing that's all aware of each other and all pulling together you know all working together now the last part of, uh, of the Freudian model was the uh, superego 
Well, the superego is, you know, really what we are. That's what we are to become. Love. We're to be caring. We're, it's about other, not about ourself. So the reason that Freud had that model is he was an experimentalist. He looked at people. And he looked at people and saw how they were. And he took how they were and he built a model to describe how they were. Well, most people were driven from their egos. Most people are driven out of their intellect. And their intellect is in control of their egos and motivated mostly by their fear. That's just the way most people are. So Freud said, well, most people are like that and most people seem to be functioning. So that's normal. That's a good thing. Everybody has to you know, have this ego. Well, that's really not true. And he says, well, sometimes, just every once in a while, you know, two or three percent of the time, we see people that aren't ego based. It's really about other and has nothing to do with themselves. Well, we call that superego. Well, now in our in the MBT viewpoint, that superego, that's the healthy part. That's what we're trying to become. That ego, that's mostly fear and you know, ego belief. And that's the part we're trying to let go of. But we can't, we're not going to let go of our intellectual function. All we're going to do is stop that intellectual function from being in the service of our fear. Instead, it'll be in our service of other. And then what we end up with is a whole integrated being, no subconscious, all superego, if you will, and very much aware, very much able to analyze and to think and to weigh and to judge and all those things that we do, but we're not judging in terms of I'm better than they are, you know, that would be a judge born out of fear. That's gone. So all of that, we're judging, how can I best help? You know, how can I be part of the solution here? Is someone who is more inclined to be emotional, is that someone that has broken through the layers, has evolved, or is a, is a higher level of a, of a consciousness, would you say? Well, I'd say that, that, you know, again, if the emotional and the intellectual are both just two mo modes, some of us have more facility in one of those modes than the other. You see, so some of us are just better and more expressive out of, out of the emotional mode and not so expressive out of the intellectual mode. And some of us are so totally bound up in our heads intellectually that, you know, we don't even know we have emotions because as soon as one comes up, we stuff it back down because that gets in the way. That's not logical. That's not going to help me solve this problem. So you push that emotion down. Uh, it's the same, you know, and it depends. We have the left brain, right brain uh, differentiation here too. People who generally approach the world uh, with logical process and those who approach the world uh, holistically. It's not a, a step A goes to step B goes to step C logical process. It's, oh, okay, I see the big picture. I get it. I understand the essence of it. I understand the, you know, the, the, the things that are important to understand. And all those logical details, eh, not that important. You don't need all that to get from A to B. You just intuit B rather than have to work your way there through a logical process. So those are two different ways just of employing just the intellectual part. See, that's broken into, into two parts. So you have those people who are right-brained, more intuitive. They also tend to work more out of the feelings base because they're not into the logical process. That's why I brought that in. It's all kind of related. Those people who are left-brained and very logical process, they tend to not work so much out of a feeling space because feeling and intuition is just not that reliable. You know, you can't depend on that stuff. That can lead you astray. That can take you places you don't want to go. The only thing you can trust is your intellect. So they become very, very intellectual. They're left brain. They live out of their head. And for many of those people, they will tell you they don't really have emotions. They don't have many emotions. Or they do have emotions, but they don't really affect them any. You know, they're, they're just, they're there, but they don't really affect them. It's not a it's not a big thing in their life. Their, their life is totally cerebral. So no, they, we're talking about extremes on both sides. And of course, we all know people who are very, very emotional and they don't think about anything in a logical process. They just feel and intuit everything. And, you know, we make fun of those. We call them airheads or, uh, you know, weepy people or something. Well, we make fun of the we make, yeah, we make fun of the intellectuals too. You know, we, we call them cybers and, you know, uh, you know, they act like they're computers instead of people. And, 
And uh, so, but you have both of those extremes, but because we have these functions, these various ways that we can express ourselves, some people tend to put more of their energy into one way than others. Of course, a good thing to be is balanced where you have all of it. It's completely balanced. You get rid of the ego and the fear and the belief, and now real balance is possible because now you have an intellect in the service you know, of love rather than the service of fear, and your feelings are all connected. Your intuition is very good because now you get data on lots of other levels rather than just the physical level. You're really connect, connecting to people in a, in a much fund, more fundamental way than what you normally would connect. And it all works fine. Now you're just a whole person uh, with a lot larger decision space connecting in a more multifaceted way. So that being, being able to function in all those levels, you can be extremely uh, logical when you need to be. You know, you've lost your glasses and you don't know where to find them. Well, there's a little logical process is needed there. Where did I have them, you know, last and so on. So you can be very logical process. You can read a science paper and follow it because that's all logical process. You can do math, you know, but at the same time, you're intuitive. You have a lot of empathy. You connect on a feeling level with people. You, you know, you live, you live in a body of emotion all the time, just like you live in a body of thought all the time. It's not, it's not one or the other. It's just all of it kind of mixes together in a optimal way for you to function in the reality you have at that moment. So that's kind of where we're, we're going to. So it's not that emotion is better and intellect is bad or vice versa. And it's not that intellect is dependable and emotion isn't. That's not it either. It's just these are all different ways that we can express ourselves in this virtual reality modes of expression in the virtual reality and um, you know how we express ourselves is uniquely ours which brings me to the point of you know in the context of enlightenment you know spiritualists describe the experience as an expansive um, state of bliss or an ecstasy where tears are flowing uncontrollably you know as you awaken to this greater presence of the of, of godhead as it's often referred to but in M, in mbt you describe point consciousness rather as a starting point you have you know, have your have you in your experience tom in that point consciousness state have you experienced an intensity similar to that which can be described as that emotional blissful state is that something that you've experienced oh yes sure that's basically available whenever you'd like to have it. You know, it's not, uh, it's not a difficult thing to experience. It's just opening yourself up to that. Um, you know, and that is a very worthwhile experience. It's more worthwhile the very first time you have it because now it's a big aha moment and it opens things to you. You've suddenly realized, you know, the, the capacity that you have what you're a part of, you know, you get all this realization kind of floods in. So it's a, it's a bigger deal. Maybe the first four or five, 10 times you do that. But after that, it's just an available state and you can kind of be one with the larger consciousness system. And in this state, you feel like you and everything else are all integrated. You're a part of everything. You know, you, you understand the grass and the leaves on the trees, you know, and all the people, everything, you are part of it and it's a part of you and you feel connectedness to everything. And uh, it's this big feeling of oneness. Uh, of course, all the, uh, you know, there's no fear in that state. You know, there's no ego in that state because if there were fear and ego, you wouldn't be in that state. <laughs> it's a, it, and for people who just get it momentarily, it's they drop that fear and ego, you know, for a while, they let it go. And uh, and then they pick it back up again because that's really it, part of. Is who it a they mandatory are. state to to experience what inclusivity feels like? Can you get there without experiencing that state? Yes, you can get there without experiencing that state. It's just it's a more powerful uh, experience to have you know, all at once. It's a very peak experience sort of thing. It's, it's something once have never forgotten, you know, it never grows old. 
It's not like, well, I wish I could really remember that, you know, 20 years ago I had. No, you'll remember every detail of it, no matter how long it is. So it's one of those kinds of experiences, but it's not necessary. You don't have to get to that place. You can get to an understanding that you are, um, you know, basically connected with everything, that everything is interactive with you and you're interactive with everything else. And you can get the sense of, of what it's like to be grass or leaves on a tree. You can kind of get that feeling if you wish, but it's, it's a little different than just getting it all at once in one big lump. It's, that's more overwhelming. That's more, you know, blows you away sort of thing. Whereas if you get it piecemeal, you can still get there. It's just not the big rush that you get. And the bigger, you know, the more new it is, the bigger the rush. So the more that's available to you, it's not the big rush anymore because you've done that 20 or 30 times or 50 times or really whenever you like. So it's not the big, wow, you know, feel this, feel that. It's just mostly now, if I tap into that, it's just for a few seconds. I don't need to sit there and bask in it. I just, you know, you can touch into it for a few seconds just because it's a very centering kind of thing. If you tend to get kind of out of, out of kilter, a little off center, and you just want to be centered again, that's the place to get centered. But in 10 or 20 seconds, that's enough, you know, because all the previous times you've done that come back. And then it's not just that one, but it's all of them together. You know, you re-experience all the ones you've already experienced and the one you're experiencing now. And with all of that, you can process it pretty quickly and get that, that centering uh, out of it. So it's a good state to, you know, to get in, but it's not necessary. You can evolve, grow up, let go of your ego and fear and, and um, you know, move on without that. But the more you do let go of your fear, the more likely you're going to experience that. You know, it's like it's not far away. All you have to do is open yourself to it. That was my next question was, is it something that you can – uh, you know, just holding that point state of consciousness, or is this something that is practiced in your day to day life as well? That gets well, you there. Um, well, I guess you get there when you're ready. You get there when you know. It's it's like there's several influences all have to come together at once, and pop. You know, there it is. One of them is you have to not be in a state of you know, agitation, ego, fear, that sort of thing, that will keep you from getting there. You have to be in a state where you're not processing physical reality because that will keep you from being there because you're busy processing physical stuff, right? So that means kind of a meditation state where you let go of the physical is, is important. Now, you can get that in tenths of seconds after a while, you don't have to sit down and, you know, say your mantra and, you know, light incense and cross your legs or lie down in a bed or whatever. You can get to where you can just let go of everything physical very easily and very quickly. So that's why I say you can do this in, in, you know, half a minute or something. If you don't have to go through all the rigors of, of process to get there, any place you you've been, you can get there more easily the next time. You know, so it's just a matter of, of uh, practice and doing it. So you don't have to go into that state, but you do have to let go of the chatter about physical things because that's distracting. And you do have to not be in a ego, fear, belief traps, things, because that holds you here. That keeps your, your focus on something else. And you also have to have the intent that you want to experience existence. Or you could say the larger consciousness system or God or however you want to put that. But you have to have the intent that you want to experience that. You want to just experience yourself as not disconnected from that, but as that. You want to experience your, you know, you want to experience it all everything that's available to you as consciousness. And if you have that intent, then, and if you have those other things in place, then the experience should come to you. 
Now, you could have everything in place, but never actually express the intent to do that. Hmm. And then you wouldn't do it. So you see, you still may be growing up and doing just fine, but mm -hmm. you've never really thought to say, I want to experience being one with the source. That's a thought that doesn't necessarily come to everybody to say. Which now, at some, some people, level may some indicate people, a fear. Yeah, which some level may indicate a fear or just not thinking. You know, it could be an ego. You know, ego is positive and negative. You know, the wallflower, that's an ego problem as well as the, you know, the arrogant, uh, you know, bully is an ego problem. So it could be that you just don't feel worthy, that you just don't think that that's something you could experience. Uh, and your own sense of unworthiness is ego and fear. And that can get in the way. So that's why I say there's a lot of things have to kind of come together. But then it's a pretty natural experience that you just open yourself to that. But like most of these experiences, you know, they, they are very big deals in the beginning. They're moderate deals somewhere in the middle. And then they're just not big deals later on. They're just part of life. You know, it's just like the roller coaster. First time you were ever on a roller coaster, you know, you were probably eight years old and it was the biggest thing that ever happened to you. But eventually getting on a roller coaster now at, you know, 50 years old, it eh, just doesn't have much appeal anymore. You know, you've you've done it enough that it's just not that exciting. You know, basically how it's going to go, how it's going to feel, you know, and it just plays out according to the way you know that it's going to play out. It's not that exciting anymore. You don't have this rush of, oh, my God, now what's going to happen? You know what's going to happen, you see. So it's it's that sort of thing, too. It's it gets less and less of a of a uh, of a, a major a big thing. But that doesn't mean that it isn't any less significant. It's just as significant as it was on the first time, probably more significant because the first time you're so blown away that you really don't know what to do or think. It's just an experience. Later on, you can just kind of get it and feel it and connect everything because you know where all the pieces are and how it is and what's there. And it's a, it's a much more, uh, I don't know. I, I think you get more out of it later on than you really do in the, in the beginning. It gets to be more significant rather than less significant with time. It's just, it's just not a big rush. It's not the, you don't have the same excitement level that you have. Does it serve as a fire or a spark for you to follow a specific path in your life or to be more intense towards a specific cause or a purpose? Yes, it does. And it does that because it centers you so well. You really feel like you know what reality is all about and your place in it. You know, the, any confusion to the contrary disappears. You feel one with everything. You feel that what you're doing and what you're trying to do and where you're going, you know, everything is fine. You're doing the best you can, you know, with whatever you have at the time. And that's as good as it gets. So you stop second guessing, you know, you stop doing the rest of it. It's just everything is okay. After that kind of connection, you get centered. And at least for a while, everything is just proper and in its place. You've got that kind of bigger picture. It'll all work out. You are who you are. You'll do what you do. And hopefully in the process, you'll learn along the way. And that's just the way it is. Rather than getting caught in the little picture of, oh, no, what's going to happen here? I really like that to happen. But is that, you see, now you're down in the weeds trying to control, trying to second guess, trying to do analysis. And you're up at, at a much higher level than that when you have this experience. And at that higher level, everything is exactly the way it's supposed to be. You're doing exactly what you're supposed to be. It doesn't mean, doesn't mean that you're actually going to get it right or it's going to work out the way you think. It's just you are interacting. You're doing what you're doing. And that's giving you opportunities to learn. Whether you do it badly or do it well isn't as important as that you do it and learn from it, you see. So everything now seems in its place. So the details that had you worried before aren't important anymore. It's the process. It's not the, it's not the end point. It's the process that's important. It's not what happens. It's how you are and how you meet things is important, not what really happens. So that takes all the pressure off. You know, all you have to do is pay attention and, uh, you know, try to do the best you can. And you know that that's perfect. You can't get any more perfect than that. And whether what you're trying to do fails or, or succeeds isn't that big a deal. So with that higher viewpoint, 
then there's no pressure. There's no angst. There's no whatever. It's everything's okay. So that's kind of the joy of it. That's why I say it's a centering thing. When you feel like you're kind of digging yourself into a hole or you're getting too focused on something or something's become too important, you know, that it's, it's it doesn't feel right anymore, then getting that centering thing is just a good way to kind of let all the small stuff go, stay focused on what the big thing is, and then let all the chips fall where they may, and that's fine. So it's not like it gives you instructions about how to succeed, what it is you're trying to do. It just, it just plugs you into a bigger picture and uh, lets you feel the whole thing and your part in it. And if, you're, if you are a, you know, a growing individual who's learning and, and getting rid of your fear, then you feel like you're, you're right on. You, know, you are where you need to be. And like you said, there needs to be this balance point because you can't think your way there, obviously. And you can't no, be extremely, you cannot think your way. You can't extreme be extremely emotional and, and try to get there because then, you know, you're gonna sort of have a bit of insecurity or maybe a lot of insecurity for that matter. But you need to balance yourself first. Find that nexus right. point, if you will. Can so I guess my question is when you see, you know, as a parent looking at for example, your child, and you see that they are inclined to be one way versus the other, is your job, I mean, some schools of thought say, you know, focus on their strengths. Now, that's, that child tends to be, you know, a good logical analytical thinker, That or that child has a, you know, great way to connect with people, she's very emotional, or, or this or that. Is our job as a parent try to bring them to that balance point, or is our job to allow them to sort of... Um, leverage the strength both are yeah it's both are the thing that would be wrong to do is to try to push or pull them in one direction or the other in other words this let's say they're really good at, at logical process well that's good and you should encourage logical process because that's something obviously they connect with that's the way they are well being the way you are is much less stressful than trying to be some way you are not. So you try to encourage that. But at the same time, you try to, to ensure that the intuitive side, the caring side, the emotive side is also act, being activated. So at that point, you encourage the, the uh, logical process, but you may spend as much time discussing, well, how did you feel about that? How did that make you feel? What do you think will happen? You know, this, things that they, there's no logical way to get there. So they have to either intuit or do something else. So you can bring those things up and, and lead them to, particularly young children. Young children are very intuitive. You know, the, the, that intuitive side is, is open and, and uh, very available. As they get older, they tend to shut that intuitive side down and then the intellectual side starts to take over. But if you can help keep that intuitive side going as well as encourage that intellectual side too, you know, they need to be who they are. And some of us just are more one way than the other. And we need to work through the way we are rather than trying to be somebody else. You know, it's like the people who were left-handed a long time ago, they tried to force them to be right-handed. No, you're not, you're holding the, you know, the pen in the wrong hand, you know, no, you're holding the fork in the wrong hand, do it right-handed, you know, well, that just creates a lot of angst. It doesn't feel natural. It doesn't feel right, but you learn to do it anyway. And it's, you know, it's, it's good to be able to use both hands. So it's like, well, yeah, go ahead, use your left hand. But at the same time, you need to be able to do things with that right hand, too. So you don't want people just walk around with only one hand they can use. You, you want them to be able to do it. But if they excel in one or the other, well, that's OK. Use what you excel at, what comes natural. It's the way you're put together. It's the way your body's wired. You know, some of that's just organic to the rule set. So, yes, I'd say encourage whatever proclivities they have, but also encourage the opposite. And you can do that in subtle ways. It's not like you can sit, you, you can't sit down and give an intellectual talk about the non-intellectual side of things. Right. <laughs> that, that doesn't work. You have it. to express <laughs> that with, yeah, you have to express that with feeling, you know, you have to connect and, and let people 
realize they have feelings and what does that mean and, and uh, you know, where does that take you and how does that make you feel and how do you think these other people feel, you know, and that's starting to help them get empathy. You know, how did, how do you think that made your sister feel? You know, how did you think that made, you know, grandma feel? And, you know, what are the, some of the kinds of things we could do that would make grandma feel good, you know, as opposed to, you know, not, and let him think in terms of people's feelings. Because if he thinks in terms of people's feelings, then he's more likely to be aware of them. And that side of him will grow. So it's just, if you look at their weaknesses, and when the weaknesses are something important like empathy, well, you have to get them to go there occasionally. Because otherwise, if you let it all be intellectual process, they won't go there. And pretty soon, that's unavailable. They can't touch that anymore. They don't really know how to do that because they haven't practiced it. They haven't worked with not a part of their life. So it's better to make them whole people. Uh, let them excel where they excel, but don't let them get too out of balance. The right brain, left brain thing. We ought to be whole brain. We ought to not be so much one or the other. And we need to, because the attributes of both are important some places. A right brain, right brain attributes. Yeah, right brain attributes are you know, irreplaceable. There's a lot of things that, that you need to do intuitively in life. A lot of times, almost always, you don't have all the information. You can't make a logical connection between A and B because you've only got 10% of the information, you know, necessary to get there. You know, you know, big, any big things like that. You, who am I, who am I going to marry? Should I marry Susie or Sally or Rebecca? Well, all of those are possible. Well, you'll never get enough information to make that a logical choice. Well, that's an important choice. That's a choice that's going to affect the rest of your life. You need some intuition here to get at that at a feeling level to see which of that, you know, which of those feels right, feels better. You connect to more on an emotive and an empathetic level. So that's an important part of that decision, not just a list of attributes and how they connect with your attributes. You know, that's all intellectual. So your, your intuitive parts are a very important part of your everyday life because most of the time we don't have all the information to make a logical choice. So we, if we don't use our intuition, we basically just guess. We say, well, I really don't know. So yeah, we'll do this. Well, you know, randomness isn't exactly, you know, the best way to build something, you know, it, uh, it's, it's as wrong as often as it's right. And something that's major in your life, like who you're going to marry, you know, that's not something you want to leave up to randomness if you can help it. So it's really important to have a strong intuitive sense and a strong empathy and a strong connection with other people. So you really understand their feelings and, and, you know, them as people, you give them, um, you know, more, more life, I guess, than just a cardboard cutout is kind of what you see when it's intellectual. You know, everybody's like a cardboard cutout that does things, but you don't really relate to why they do them or, you know, what their point is or what their purpose is. They just do them and you react to them. That's kind of the intellectual thing. You know, it's not really a connection there. Well, the intellectual is also very important, you know, particularly if there's some jobs and some parts of life that analysis is critical. You have to be able to think your way through problems. So I'd say that neither one of those is more important than the other. They're both equally important. You just need to be able to do both of them uh, well, because sometimes you need one and sometimes you need the other. Sometimes if you use that logic to find your lost glasses, sometimes you can just intuit it. You can just close your eyes and see where those glasses are. You see, that's another way to approach that problem. People who are really good with intuition can sometimes get to the solution much faster than people who have to get there with logical process. But then if you rely 100% on that intuition, now you are at risk of walking down, you know, la-la land, leading yourself into some belief trap that really, if you thought about it, doesn't make any sense. But it feels good. So you go there anyway. So you need both, yes. I remember the, watching one TED Talk and um, – it was a lady who had a – actually, she wrote a book. It was called Stroke of Insight, if you heard mm -hmm. it. And she had a stroke in the – I believe it was the left hemisphere. 
and she woke up or she she came to realize a different sense of awareness when the right yeah. hemisphere sort of took over. So even though, we're, even though we're talking about a virtual brain here, there are the constraints that the one hemisphere has that it can impose on the consciousness that's right. coming through versus the other. And, mm-hmm. you know, the key is to find that balance point, like you're saying. Yes, yes. And we in the, in the Western world tend to uh, greatly uh, revere the left brain and the logical process, and we don't give a lot of credence to the intuitive part. And probably if you went back, oh, I don't know, you know, 500 years, you'd probably find almost everybody was just the opposite. It was that intuitive part of the brain that was really, really important because that's what got you by. And that left part, eh, you know, you're good for certain things to help you catch a rabbit. But it's it wasn't uh, necessarily the part that you lived your life through most of the time. So it's, but our technological society is a lot of of logical manipulations of things. So that's where the good jobs are. And that's, you know, where uh, people uh, put high status. It's almost like a pendulum swinging, isn't it, Tom? I mean, we went from this, you know, peak in intuition to now we're sort of going into the technological sort of IT phase. And now we're, we're trying to find the middle ground. And this is really where MBT kind of, I think, speaks yeah. volumes is, is trying to to marry that science and spirituality sort of together and find that sort of balance point. Yes, that is true. We need that. We need that balance. And I do think the pendulum is swinging back uh, some, you know, it, the people are beginning to find out they do have an intuitive side and that you can grow that intuitive side. It doesn't have to be uh, something you can't trust. It can be something that you, you know, trust a whole lot. You just have to understand it and, you know, work with it to where it's a, it's a, it's a trustworthy part of you. If you never use it and you, um, you know, if you're just short of denying that it even exists, then it's not going to be very trustworthy. Same with your intellect. You know, if, if you were entirely intuitive and you just kind of deny even that intellectual process is important, you wouldn't be very good at, uh, you know, doing things that require logical process. So it, it's something we're moving toward and I think that's a that's a good thing. Now, whether we will go back through the middle and go over the other way, I don't think so. I think our I think our technological life, you know, all of the things we have to deal with, will force us into logical process enough that uh, we can always have that. Maybe not. You know, we had a we had a computer, and a computer 30, 40 years ago required a lot of logical process because it didn't have a graphical user interface. You know, it didn't have uh, plug and play. It didn't have any of that stuff. You needed a lot of logical process if you were going to get a computer and plug a peripheral into it. You know, that required knowing a lot of details and a lot of facts and how to do that and how your computer worked and how did the operating system work and how many you know, things could you plug into it of what type and had to make sure that they didn't interfere with each other. I don't know if you remember those bad old days of computing, but there was a lot of things you have to do. Now, eh, not so much. Plug it in and it works because it has information that tells it in, you know, internally to the computer system how to, how to connect and how to resolve problems and that sort of thing. So in some ways, our, our technology may help us move back to a less uh, dependent on the, uh, on the left brain. It'll take care of a lot of that left brain stuff for us, and we won't have to be that way quite as much as we have been. So maybe we'll have a balance with our technology. You know, it'll help us find it'll help us find that balance. I like that. We're going to jump to some questions, Tom, from a few of my listeners. Uh, they've sent in a few questions. Uh, a question pertaining to reincarnation as it relates to culture. Do we typically choose to reincarnate in the same cultural reality, maybe to feel a sense of security or even choose the same soul family? Does jumping from culture to culture with each successive avatar indicative of a IUOC that is more relatively evolved? Yes, yes, and yes on both of those. Uh, As you are evolved more in the quality of your consciousness, you are more willing and able to take on differences, to take on challenges, to see things from another perspective and gain from it, okay? 
that's why you would want to do that. You'd want to experience different cultures, different points of view, because all of them kind of leading to the same place. But if you can get to the same place through five different paths, then you've got it a lot stronger. You know, you understand it a lot better than if you just get there through one path. So, yes, there is cross-cultural, uh, pur purposeful cross-cultural jumping uh, just because it's another viewpoint. It's another way of looking at things. And it's also true not only in culture, but in all sorts of viewpoints, you know, rich and poor, sick and healthy, uh, you know, crippled and, and uh, um, athletic. You know, you can get lots of different viewpoints and it's valuable to have those viewpoints. It's very valuable to a growing. It's like travel. Yeah. So we're thinking, you know, we think about travel. People who used, you know, 100 years ago, most people never got more than 20 miles away from where they lived, you know, or maybe 200 years ago. You know, it just, they just didn't travel that much. And they were called provincial and they didn't have a very big picture. People who traveled, even though they didn't do anything in particular other than just travel, they were more sophisticated. They had bigger pictures. They understood things for the higher, higher level of synthesis, if you will, than the people who never traveled. Well, it's the exact same thing. If you have the same set of experiences all the time, then, all right, you may get pretty good at that. So you're pretty comfortable with it and you're pretty confident with it. But there's more, you know, it's still local. It's still provincial. You need to get out and experience from lots of different viewpoints before you can understand different viewpoints. Once you've been that, it's a whole lot easier to empathize with that and understand it and connect to it than if it's just foreign to you and you have no idea what it would like to be dirt poor or starved to death you know, of hunger or whatever. When you've done those things, it opens you up. It just gives you a broader perspective and you're not nearly so judgmental anymore because you can see it from those different perspectives. So it's a useful thing to do to have those different cultural and different economic uh, experiences. You also sometimes get into places where you're, you're swept up into something. You know, uh, you get in areas where, let's say, wars are going on or have been going on, you know, for a long time. Well, then it's not like you're going to sit back and say, well, gee, you know, I've already learned that war is a bad thing to do and we don't want to do all that. So I'm kind of an anti-war person. But there, none of that seems to click in. You just get swept up in it because that's in your culture. And now when you see people getting swept up in the violent things, you're not quite so quick to judge them. Why do they do that? Why don't they just say no? You say, well, there's reasons for that. You can get swept up into those kinds of things and you appreciate you know, more what's going on in the world. And you're not as quick to, to, to say, I have the answer and, you know, other people are doing it wrong because you've also done it wrong in a lot of places, you know, in a lot of ways. And you understand how easy that is to do sometimes. So it's just being more sophisticated, you know, as travel goes, you know, it's a way of having more, more viewpoints and a bigger understanding and a bigger picture. So yes, cross-cultural, we even, sometimes jump across uh, 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 virtual realities. We don't always have to come into the same virtual reality, although that's a bigger, that's kind of at a higher level, but that also gives us different perspectives of how things, of how things work. But for the most part, in the earlier um, parts of our consciousness evolution, we tend to do what we know because it's better to get at ease and get good at something before you start branching out, you know, it's, uh, it's better that you live in your, in your small town until you're maybe in your thirties or forties before you travel, because then at thirties and forties, you'll get a whole lot more out of that travel than you would if you were 10 years old. Yeah. At 10, you'd see a lot of stuff, but eh, it really wouldn't sink in. It really wouldn't impress you a whole lot. And you wouldn't get as much out of it as if you were older. So sometimes, you know, you do have to stay and work with something and get good at it. And you, once you know the ropes, it's easier to get back in and do that same thing, you know, a similar kind of thing in a similar kind of place and so on. But so the, in the masses, the largest part, yes, a lot of it is repetitive uh, in the parts that are little, you know, that are to a point where the, the differences are, are important to their growth, then they, they tend to experience a lot of differences. So would you say individuals who have reached that state of enlightenment 
um, whether it be the Christ consciousness, whether it be the Buddha consciousness, they are more likely to jump from one reality to another. To they probably them. already they probably already have jumped from lots of realities to the other by the time they're at that point. They've probably already done that, and uh, they may continue. But at that point, once you get to where most of the ego and, and is gone and the fear is gone. What you do then is tend to focus on where can I be the most help? You know, what can I do? And sometimes you also just need refresher courses where, all right, I, I want to get in a situation that's stressful. You know, that's challenging. Maybe I will be put into one of those cultures where they're constantly at war to see whether I just pick up my, you know, pick up my guns and knives and, you know, stuff and, and start marching with everybody else. Or do I do something differently? And so there's lots of yeah, there's lots of things that you that you might do, particularly with consciousness. Your consciousness, like everything else, starts to de-evolve, starts to come apart, starts to decay, uh, start the entropy starts to go up. If you don't put any effort into it, it it takes constant effort, just like your house. You never put any maintenance into your house. Your house will eventually rot and fall down. Well, everything's like that. Everything disintegrates, decomposes, you know, falls apart without effort. You always have to put effort to maintain things. That's just the nature. That's the second law of thermodynamics, basically, and applies to everything. So if you're not constantly working on keeping or making your consciousness more evolved and keeping it evolved, it will start to de-evolve. So if you just sit back and say, well, I'm here, I've, you know, I'm done, I've made it, so... You know, I'm going to sit on the cloud and play a harp now. Then, you know, you'll start to de evolve. So the idea that, okay, you're the Buddha and you may come back, you know, into another body struggling someplace. Well, why would that be necessary? Well, it's necessary sometimes, like I say, just for refresher courses, just to go back and see if, you know, your choices that you make, was that just a fluke? Did you just happen to get on a track that helped you go that direction? Or do you really have what it takes to go in that direction every time? You see, so there's those kinds of things to do it well. And the more you do that, the more stable and, and robust your growth is. You know, evolution can be tenuous as well as robust. You know? So, and it acts yeah. as, a, as a guide, if you will, to the rest of them, as a lighthouse, if you will, to, to sort of move consciousness down a specific pathway maybe a little more efficiently so it can be used by design would you say sure yeah absolutely by design most of your you know most of the people who have gained a, a great deal of conscious quality their incarnations are by design they don't just have one they typically pick those that they think will offer the challenges that will be of value to them and they pick those that they think where they can be most useful you know where can i be of help now at this time in this place with this people and the cultures we have and the people we have and you know this environment where the simulation is right now what could i do that would be you know would be helpful and then you may do that and find out you know you weren't helpful at all you know you got uh, you know your free will took you off on some other tangent and uh, you got all wadded up over uh, trying to depose the dictator or something and uh, then uh, well I guess I had more to learn than I thought, you see. Now you start picking things more in that vein to challenge you in those ways than you had before. So there's so many avenues, so many paths that you can take, to, you know, things that you can work on. There's so many aspects to a personality and to a consciousness that you're never going to run out of things to do. There's always something else to do. And the fact that entropy increases if you don't keep working on it well, you're not going to run out of things to do. So to me, enlightenment is a, is a process. It's a thing you progress toward, but it's not an endpoint. It's not like you get to enlightenment and now you know everything and you're done. That's not it at all. I think that, that idea was a wishful thinking of some who uh, you know, probably had, had more ego than they, than they realized. <laughs> uh, you're not done. As long as there's somebody else that you can help, you're not done. And if you're ever done, you'd start to become undone because that's the nature of entropy. 
So this idea of getting done, I'm enlightened in it and, uh, you know, I, I'm out of here and I don't have to do this anymore is um, wishful thinking. It doesn't really work like that. We're consciousness and this is this is what we do. We lower entropy. Would you, what or who determines the data stream that serves me best? Is it a computed, is it computed or is it at some level there is an IUOC or a team of IUOCs that are working with each free will awareness unit? Um, it's some of both. Part of it is you. You have your own ideas. You as an you individual unit of consciousness have some idea of what your strengths and weaknesses are. So you have certain things you'd like to do, accomplish, and maybe certain ideas you think that would be good for you to try because from the last time, well, this, this, this happened and now you'd like to see that from the other side or you'd like to, you know, maybe that was too hard. You'd like to do something a little easier this time. Uh, so it's the, the individual has a strong input to it, but the individual doesn't know what slots are available, you know, what uh, avatars are available, what their, what their uh, future probability looks like. And for a lot of avatars, future probability is a pretty fuzzy thing. You really don't know. You know, you know potentials, you know, somewhat. So the system has to be involved with that because it's only the system that has that bigger picture that, that knows kind of where everything is and what everybody's doing. So the system will pick something out that looks like it has a, a decent probability of giving you what you need. But there's no, you know, there's no guarantee that any of it will work out. You know, it's, it's always a fair amount of randomness in it, but you, you kind of get something that says, well, this looks like it's got the potential to right. be what you want. So general right. sort of idea of this is where I want right. to be, but you don't know the specifics of how it plays no. out. You don't have any idea how that's going to play out. Yeah. You may have wanted to come in to learn a certain thing and that just may not even come up in your life anymore because suddenly you know, your parents got the uh, disease and they died and you went off to your evil aunt that, you know, kept you in a closet and just everything goes to hell in a handbasket. And now you're a different kind of person. Or maybe you're the one, you know, who becomes a quadriplegic. And, uh, you know, that's not really what you had in store and, you know, in mind. But, hey, that's a great learning opportunity. Now you get to, you know, deal with things that you've never dealt with before. So the thing is, any situation is a good learning opportunity. You know, even the most horrendous situation you can think of, it's a good learning opportunity. If you can grab, you know, the opportunities that come your way and, and make something of them, it will be a very successful incarnation, whether you were rich or poor or, you know, a quadriplegic or, you know, a star athlete. There are challenges in all of those. They're just different challenges. So it's not like some of those are good incarnations because you were happy and, you know, got to drink a lot of beer and have a lot of fun. Or those that are bad carnations because you were, you know, dirt poor and, you know, starved to death. It's not like that. You get to learn a lot in anything. So in a way, yes, here's the potential to go the way you want in this situation. But however it works out, you'll learn something from it. You have opportunities to grow and learn. And over the long term, you know, you, you're sampling over lots and lots of incarnations most of them will turn out more or less the way, you know, that you were hoping. Some of them won't. But, you know, in general, that's why you pick up something with good potential. That means it's got a, you know, a decent chance of going that way. And then you, you just do whatever you do. And it's, you know, it is, it is what it is, you know, because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of variation, things that can happen that changes it a lot. So. That's the way it works. It's none of it is real buttoned down. Now, the most buttoned down of the incarnations are the ones that are very specifically almost scripted. They're planned for you to do a particular thing in a particular time at a particular place or maybe meet some particular person at a particular place. There's very specific things there. Now, because free will makes that improbable, you know, that, that these things will just happen to work out, that that works out. They're nudged. They're nudged like you have to meet somebody and and uh, that's part of a plan that you've made before you incarnated with this other person. And for some reason, you just feel like you've got to move to California, you know, or you've just got to, you know, go to Georgia or someplace and you just 
feel the need and things you read just make you think that that's a good idea and people you meet kind of make you think it's a good idea. So you do it. And, you know, that's where that other person is. So that's what I mean by nudged. You get these these nudges. Uh, your intuition is your connection with the larger conscious system. And that connection works both ways. Not only can you get information in a download, you know, but uh, it's going both ways. How you feeling about things, you can get an intuition that says, you know, move to Georgia. It's better there. You'll like the climate. Oh, there's a good job there. You'll do better. The job you're at, uh, that's getting stale. You need something else. And anyway, you can so is, is thought things. then, uh, just to touch on that, I mean, thought is the consciousness is the one that's actually thinking it. But the intuition is coming from the higher level, the IUOC? It can. Yes, it can. In other words, you're getting a download of information. That download of information can have multiple sources. See, it can be something that's put in your data stream just for you to experience. You know, and uh, you may be the only one that experiences that. And you know it was real, no matter how much other people think it's impossible. That data was put in your data stream to give you that experience. And if you have some plan that you've made with others in your incarnation or some plan that you've something you need to accomplish, you know, some particular project you need to you need to push on, um, then you'll get nudged to be at the right place at the right time to do that. You still have to make the free will choices. When, when your intuition says, I need to move, I need to go someplace else, I think I, I ought to go to Georgia, your, your, your free will can say, I don't want to go to Georgia. You know, I don't want to go there. It's just got this problem and there's too many bugs, you know, too many mosquitoes. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to live in a place like that. I want to live in a desert. Well, you can do that. Well, now that just doesn't, you just don't meet that person then. And that connection doesn't make it. And it, everybody goes on and does the best they can anyway, you see. What's the but key, Tom, mostly, to distinguishing? What's, what's the, the key? key to distinguishing and listening to that higher voice? Ah, uh, Well, the key is that uh, you're not going to be in this, uh, two keys, really. One is you're not going to be in this situation where you have um, these planned things to do, kind of a script to follow, and you're going to have nudges unless you already are uh, fairly well evolved in your consciousness. This is not something the low level's doing. This is something only that the higher levels are doing. So you're going to have a more intuitive connection. You're going to already be more aware of you know, non-physical aspects. So you've, you've got that ability is kind of on the upper, in the upper tier of those abilities to begin with. Secondly, you get to know when you're just accessing data from a database or you're just saying, well, what's the best thing I should I marry Sally or Sue? OK, that's a question. And you're going to get information on that. But it's information about, you know, possibilities, probable futures, uh, you know, interconnections. And you're going to gather all that in in an intuitive sense. Well, that's basically getting data from a database. But if suddenly you get something that says, you know, you need to, you know, find somebody else altogether. Neither one of those. It just comes and hits you like that. All of a sudden, you're aware of that. Well, that feels like more. It's something from, you know, the system. It's not something you really ask for. I ask for a comparison between those two. Now I get something that's that's something else, pertinent, but it's not what I ask for. It's it it feels outside of you rather than inside of you. And it gives you a new viewpoint, a new look, a new nudge of doing something that maybe really wouldn't normally have occurred. You know, So you, you start to be able to tell the difference between when you're getting data and when you're getting a message from the larger consciousness system. And of course, if you haven't evolved very much, then your other question is, did I just make that up? Is that part of my fear? I'm afraid of getting married at all, or I'm afraid of uh, being... Uh, you know, uh, intimacy or something. So I just need to back out of both of those. You see, now that could just be your fear talking. So you see, it's very confusing unless you evolve to the point where it's not, a, not confusing. That's why these things only happen at the, you know, more upper echelons of, of, uh, low entropy consciousness. That's why they don't happen down at the lower levels because you wouldn't be able to deal with it. It wouldn't be profitable for you to to get into that, there's too many variables there with the with the fear 
and the ego. But as those variables get, you know, less and less of them, as the fear goes away, then it gets clearer and clearer as to what you're doing and why you're doing. <laughs> the subtle nature of it, I mean, it's just, it can be really masked with a lot of fear, obviously, so you don't hear yeah. it at all. Whereas in, like you said, someone who's evolved can really distinguish the, the signal to noise ratio is, has really come down where they can really hear that clearly. Yeah. And, and another thing is you never, you know, you should always be skeptical of all the information you get. You should always be skeptical. So if, if you know, if just out of the blue, somebody says, you know, you should do this, I would not suggest just picking up and doing it. Bad idea. You see, you need to say, eh, okay, I'll consider it. I'll see, you know, why? Why should I do that? Where's that going? You still have to be in charge. It's your free will and you have to make the decision. It's not like you get to the point that, you know, you know, voices whisper in your ear and tell you what to do. You know, that is not a good place to be. You have to be in charge and you have to do it because you decide that's what you want to do. It's your responsibility to make a free will decision. And if you do get to the point and some some right brainers get into this problem where they will will uh, depend so much on their intuition that they'll stop using their free will. They'll let the voice or, you know, the data they get, tell them everything, you know, is this an appropriate time for me to take a trip? You know, should I do this or that? You know, they can't, you know, decide anything without consulting, you know, the Oracle or the stars or their intuition or their guide or somebody else. They get very dependent. Well, they've just given up their free will. They're not making choices anymore. They're following directions. You see, well, what happens then is the system tells you to take a long walk off a short pier and you get all wet. Because it just wants you to know that if you depend on somebody else to make your choices for you, you will end up wet. You know, you're going to end up in, in trouble. So that's typically what will happen there. You'll get some bad information that will that you should have known better, but you did it because they said so. So you always have to be very skeptical of what you get and where, it, you know, it's not so much where it comes from, but how does it fit into your life? How does it feel? And if you keep getting that nudge and the nudge keeps coming and it starts feeling better and better, like, yeah, okay, I think maybe I can kind of feel the opportunity in Georgia, you know? I kind of feel if I went there, there'd be opportunity for me. It's starting to feel really good. Well, that's different than just getting the message and then packing your bags and leaving. That's not a good idea. You have to come to the conclusions of what you're doing on your own, your own free will, and never get into a case of, of following direction. Skeptical of everything. And not to play the devil's advocate here, but I, I, sometimes you think that, well, you want to step into your fear as well. Like something that pulls you, but yet you're resistant because it's, a, it's an uncomfortable place. You want to step into that even though you feel the fear of going into it. Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. That's almost a, a given. People who want to get rid of a fear, well, it's a fear. It's scary. You know, getting rid of a fear is a scary thing. And the only thing that, that accomplishes that is courage. You have to have the courage to go ahead and step into it anyway, even though it frightens you. And, and you have to understand if it frightens you too much, you may want to back out a little bit and then uh, try it again. But if you're committed, if you really want to do it, you will, and you will beat it. If it's just that you think you should do it, you see, it's an intellectual thing. I really need to get rid of this fear. I think I should do this. Then it probably won't work. It'll probably chase you away and you never actually get there. But if you really want to do it, at the being level, it's not that you think you should, but you want to, then you will. You'll keep going back and you'll keep going back. And if it pushes you, you know, if you recoil, you'll go back until you master it and you get rid of the fear. So the, the, the biggest thing in getting rid of the fear is to get to the point that you really want to get over it, as opposed to you think you should. The, so it's the same with anything. If you are addicted to nicotine and you smoke cigarettes, you know, if you really want to stop and you're committed to that, not just that you think you should because it would be better and your friends would like you better and it might be healthier than you think you should, that's a tough road to hoe. But if you're really committed, I will do this, then you will. You'll just do it and the symptoms 
you know, the withdrawal symptoms will be trivial. They really won't be much. You'll just go right through it. But if you're trying to talk yourself into it because you think it's what you ought to do, the symptoms will be horrible because you're not really committed to doing it. It's true of lots of things and, and particularly of getting rid of fear is like that. So step number one is to want to do it seriously at the being level. And it's not just I want to, I will do this. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to jump in that water until I learn how to swim, you know, and uh, don't be stupid about it. You know, jump in shallow water to start with, but you just keep at it and keep at it and keep at it, even though you're terrified of water and eventually you'll be a good swimmer. But if you just think I should learn to swim, you know, it really would be better. Everybody makes fun of me because I can't swim. So I should do this. Well, you'll have a little of a bad thing and you'll retreat from it and convince yourself. Your ego will convince you that you really shouldn't do that after, anyway. It's probably some off thing will happen if you do that. And you need to follow that intuition, not to not to get in that water. And, uh, you know, it's not a good thing to do. So your ego will convince you you're doing the right thing to stay away from the water. A couple more questions here from listeners, and I really want to get to these. One is about time, and one is about dreams. Uh, first one, about time. If the LCS created the rule set to allow this PMR to play itself out, you know, let's go back to the virtual Big Bang. How is time different in the LCS versus in the PMR? What I'm asking is, can the larger consciousness system jump ahead 13 billion years or so and say, well, here's where the Homo sapiens enter the evolutionary picture. So let's start here. Or does time have to play itself out in the larger consciousness system as well? Okay. Uh, in general, time has to play itself out because it's a rules set thing. And when, when something evolves, the future states depend on past states. Okay, so as things evolve, you don't suddenly, you know, just have a, a fish leap out of the water and land, you know, on the beach, you know, as a, as a monkey. You know, it doesn't work like that. It has to first get little legs that drag it along the shore. And then, it ha you know, it, it's a whole series of steps to get there. So you can't jump ahead in something that is evolving because the, now having said that, you can look ahead at the probabilities, what is likely to happen here. But you have to realize there are only probabilities, and that might not happen. But you can look at the probabilities and the potential for things. And if you're the larger consciousness system, and let's say you're running this, you've, you started this simulation at the big digital bang. All right, now you've got a couple of billion years before you even get an avatar of any sort. You know, it takes you a couple of billion years to come up with a bacteria, you know, much less something that, that will serve as a consciousness, uh, you know, avatar for consciousness to learn. Well, you can always speed up the clock. You can always make your delta T bigger, fatter, so that each so that each delta T now jumps you, say, a whole second in time rather than 10 to the minus 44 seconds that it does now. It maybe jumps you 10 seconds. Or if you've got billions of years, maybe it jumps you a whole day, you see. So your delta T can get big, and particularly when things are mostly... Uh, you know, mostly uh, random, you know, like in the, when the when the when the big digital bang first started and you had matter, you know, expanding and cooling and all this stuff going on. Well, a lot of that was very random, you know, just what happened to be where, when and what pulled what. So when those things are like that, you can kind of skip through that, you know, can speed that process up without doing too much damage. So at that time, I would think that the system started to run it in fast time, if you will. It started to go by quicker and uh, it may have, you know, sped up. And I think physicists call that inflation. There's a time that the physicists call inflation where everything seemed to go a lot faster. And to me, that would be it was a very boring part of the evolution, but it was going to take a long time to get through it. And it was mostly random anyway. So you could kind of speed through it, make some assumptions as you went, and it would be okay. It wouldn't do a lot of damage because you weren't really depending on picky, low-level processes at that point. It was just big, big, big things happening. It wasn't so much that the little details mattered too much. So you can skip over a lot of those details. See, little details maybe take tiny little delta Ts to work out the details. But if you can just skip over the details because they're not all that important early on, 
then you can go very fast. So it can do that. It can speed up till it gets to a more useful part of the experiment, uh, you know, to the simulation, and then it can slow down, and then it can slow down some more until it gets to a point where it's got the, you know, the time resolution that it has now. You see, and and uh, so is this time resolution equal to the time resolution that's in the larger constant system? Would you no, say? not at all. Every virtual reality can have its own clock. You see, the, the time, our virtual reality has a spatial resolution and a time resolution. All simulations are like that. If it's a dynamic simulation, that means things change with time. Well, the way that works is you calculate how things are, then you increment time a little bit and calculate how they changed. How are they now? You know, so let's say motion. You know, something is traveling. Well, here it is now. A delta T later, well, now it's over there. And a delta T later, now it's further along. So things happen as time goes on. You can make that delta T be whatever you want. And also, you know, it's just a, it's a choice. When you set up a simulation, that's one of the things that the people making the simulation decide. What's a good delta T? If you make delta T too small, you have a lot of resolution, but you've got a lot of crunching to do. Now to make that guy, you know, move an inch, it takes 10 million delta T's to get him to move that inch. Well, that's a lot of data you have to crunch to get that result. So if you have it to where it's only, you know, once every you know, second, well, now the guy can move more than, you know, can move more than that because time's going by faster. But now maybe the motion's jerky. You know, it's not, it's not so smooth anymore. So you want more resolution. So as the characters involved are more dependent on details, then you need to have a smaller delta T. Now, the same thing is with the, with the, the delta X, if you will, X, Y, and Z in a, in a three-dimensional reality like ours. We call that a little delta volume. You can make that bigger. So now that every you know, unit of time, the, every step is now a bigger step. So now maybe every step, the smallest amount you can move in that step is a foot. Yeah. The next delta T, you can't move anything less than a foot because that's the pixel size. The pixel is one foot. So you move to the next pixel, that's a foot. Well, there's a lot of small things that can't happen there. You can't bend over and pick up a pin off the ground if you move that way, you see. So now you need more resolution. You need a smaller space and you need a smaller time, you see. So it's, it's, but you get more computation for that, more throughput. So you get space resolution and time resolution to suit what it is you want you know, the simulation to do. So now we have people uh, you know, with atom smashers looking into the little details of things. We need a lot of resolution so that they can get a result there. You know, all the results fell between pixels. You know, they wouldn't be able to get results. They would have, you know, you get either this pixel or that pixel. You couldn't get anything in between. It'd be like there was this blank space where nothing happened. So that's so when you set up a simulation, you have a few things to know. How much memory is it going to take? How much processing power is it going to take? And, you know, what's the throughput? What's the data rate? How, how often do I have to refresh it? That's the delta T. And how many calculations do I have to do, you know, between delta Ts? So bigger, big delta Ts and big delta Xs. And so what, is delta, so what is delta T in the LCS then, Tom? That's the smallest unit of time in the whole system. You see, so what happened is that as this conscious system evolved, it evolved regular time. Now, it always had a primordial time because otherwise it couldn't have evolved <laughs> to make, you know, a regular time. But as it evolved more, it had this, this sense of I can sequence things if I have regular time. You know, I can, sequ I can do every, you know, so what it did is it had its, you know, again, a digital system. It just had a state flip between one and a zero, one and a zero, which is a metronome. You know, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. Well, one, zero, one, zero, you, know, you can do that faster. And as fast as it could flip a state, that was the fastest time in the system. Everything else has to be at that speed or slower. Because in my simulation now, I can have for every 100,000 uh, ticks of, this, of the LCS's clock, the fastest speed, I'm only going to tick once in my resolution, in my virtual reality. You see, I'm just going to do one. Well, we have, we write computer programs that way, you know, that we have clock time in the computer room and then we have simulation time. 
they're not the same thing. Well, like clock time in the, in, the, in the simulation room, you know, in the computer room, that's the larger conscious system. That's the computer room, if you will. That's the fastest, that's going to be fast speed. Or that's the fastest speed that we get. And I guess I didn't say that right. It is the fastest that we can go. Okay. Now, our delta T for this virtual reality can be much slower than that. Much slower. It just has to be fast enough that it suits us. It suits you know, that the simulation is good enough for avatars to do what they need to do. And what happens with well, the way the system can, can modify it as it goes is that the, every simulation has a speed limit. And that is you can only move one pixel every delta T. If you could move 10 pixels in a delta T, now you're teleporting. Now your simulation is not smooth anymore. It's jumpy. It jerks around. There's thing here, and now that thing disappears there and appears someplace else. So if you want a if you want a smooth simulation, which is a good simulation if there are going to be people you know interacting in it, then you can only move one pixel every delta t. That's your speed limit. Now in our virtual reality, one pixel every delta t is the speed of light. That's that's the speed of light, and every virtual reality has a speed limit just like that, as long as it's a coherent uh, virtual reality that can only move one pixel of distance for one pixel of time, okay? So if, it's that, if that's the kind it is, and if it's a physical-like system, you want it to be very smooth. You don't want it to be a jumpy system because now, you've got, now you're looking in a funhouse mirror. Things, everything's distorted. It's hard to plan where anything's going to be. You know, everything is, is, is really difficult. So interactions and consequences become more random, and it's not a good place to learn. So every one has a speed limit, but the speed limits can all be different based on the nature of that virtual reality. So the larger consciousness system has the master clock and it can run everything else at some n ticks of its master clock gives you one tick of the clock for this virtual reality, but they don't have to be the same. So all the virtual realities can have their own delta T to suit whatever's going on there because you don't want to give all of them the highest speed and the highest resolution if they don't need it. You're just wasting computer resources that way. You see, if you, if you want to make this, our resolution was, you know, 10 to the minus 50th seconds and, you know, that kind of thing in, in distance, well, the calculations would be horrendous. It has to calculate everything, every change in the whole simulation, every, every 10 to the minus 50 seconds. Whew, that's a lot of work to do. Oh, only 10 to the minus 44 seconds. Wow, that's, you know, that's six orders of magnitude slower. Six, six orders of magnitude, less information it has to compute. Well, that's a lot, you see. So you don't want it to be any more than you need it to be. That's why all of them can be different. They all just have to be, you know, what works. Now, in our case, we noticed that the physicists noticed that the speed of light changes a little bit from time to time. And it changes in a way that is more than what the measurement error is. So we know it's not just measurement error because there is measurement error. But now here's a change that's a little more than the measurement error. So we know there's something going on there. Well, what happens is that sometimes as the, as the uh, avatars get capable of looking into smaller and smaller things, you know, they start to stress the resolution of the simulation, but you want to keep the ratio of delta x to delta t that defines the speed of light here. You know, it's a delta x. It's a time. It's a distance over time, right? Distance per time is velocity. So the, the speed limit is c, which is a delta x over a delta t. Now we can keep that constant if we were just to change a delta t by one half, make it smaller, and delta x by one half. Now, the ratio of delta x, the new delta x over the new delta t is exactly the same. So the speed limit stays the same. C doesn't change. But we can't just take a delta x and divide it by half because this is pixels. This is digital space. You can't just divide something by half because you have some fraction of a pixel. We can't do things in fractions of pixels. We have to do it in whole pixels at a time, you see. So if you divided it by two, there might be Oh, it'd be 162.5 or 0.3 pixels. Well, you got to throw the 0.3 pixels away. It's either 162 or 163 pixels. It's not 162.3 pixels, you see? So just dividing them doesn't work 
because it's in digital space. So you change the delta T and you change the delta X, but they're not going to exactly give you the same ratio anymore, but close because the pixels are small, but you can't make it come out precisely right. So that's what the physicists are seeing. Every once in a while, they'll see C will change just a little bit. Not much. You know, it's out in the fifth or sixth decimal place or tenth or whatever it is that you get out of the kind of pixels that we've got. But it does change some. And it's been a head scratcher for a long time. Well, it's the changes were taking place right about that time our scientists started digging deep into the, de into the details. Well, you need more resolution. You see, so... It changes a little bit, and you know, so now we get a little, you know, fifth decimal or sixth decimal place in C changes, but we can measure it to eight decimal places, so we know, you see, that it's a it's a real change, and that's why it's a real change because the the system doesn't want to have to do more calculations than necessary, so it would like to keep the speed limit the same because that has a lot to do with the way this reality works, but it would like to be able to just adjust the resolution to not be much more than what we need or what we, what we need in the foreseeable, you know, century. You know, you don't want to do this every week, but, you know, whatever we think we might need in the next century, then you can shift it to that. Does that so explain that also, Tom, that when you're in a meditative state, that how time tends to feel like it's slowing down when you're in there, but when you do get out of it, so much time has sort of passed? Yeah, it, that's a perception of time and you know time is perception of time is very uh, relative to what's going on around you and you know if you get if you go into a cave and it's dark and nothing changes you know, it's just black and you sit in that cave pretty soon you don't know whether you've been in there a week or six weeks or a month unless you have some way of you know putting piling stones or making marks on the wall or some way to do that you don't have any, there's nothing to judge, you see. So if you just sit in a black hole, yeah, time goes away. You have no sense of time. You know, I've been here a day, I've been here a year, you know, who knows? Because your sense of time disappears. It's very relative to other things. So when you, in, to your environment. So you're not necessarily so, going into a different delta T. Yeah, that's a different sort of thing now. This is just your perception. Yes. This is yes. how you perceive time. You perceive time in terms of change. Things change, you know. The, you know, the, the earth revolves once. So the sun comes up, the sun goes down. So these are changes. And we then make time in terms of these changes. That's how we perceive it. So you put yourself in an environment that doesn't change. There's no way to, you know, that's what time is. It's a, you know, time is change. Change requires time. Without any change, there's no need for time. You lose track of it. You have no perception of it anymore. So partly when you get into an altered state, your time sense will change because what you're doing um, uh, seems to go by differently. You know, your mind, your, your, your consciousness can process very, very quickly. So you can, in a matter of two or three minutes of clock time here in this virtual reality, you know, the, the, the clock on your bedside table, two or three minutes that can go by and you've done a, week, a, work, <laughs> a week's worth of work you know, in a virtual reality someplace. You've gotten up, you've gone to bed, you've done things because consciousness can process very quickly. So you can often get a lot done that doesn't take very long in the time here. And it can be the opposite as well. You can go into spaces where you're not getting, you know, things aren't happening that much. Maybe you're just sitting in that void space, just relaxing, you know, floating in the void. Sort of like uh, getting in your hot tub in a, in a dark, uh, starry night. You know, you just sit there and you're not really processing anything. And you can do that for a while and come out and find out, what, an hour and a half went by? That was an hour and a half meditation? Because see, it's just the opposite's going on now. You're not doing anything. You're just sitting there in blank space and time starts to not go by for you. You don't have any relative measure of time. But that's all perception. That's not that the delta T's are different. It's just the way we perceive time based on the changes we perceive. So if we don't perceive any changes, then we don't feel like much time's gone by. Good, great. Thank you for that. Uh, last Let's, question. I want to get to this because this is uh, about intent and focus and using the dream state. Um, 
Oh, yes, Nowalism. Nowalism and the ancient Toltec um, practice of using dreams as a way to plant a seed of intent and manifestation. And my question is, aside from using dream states to plant the seed, which may seem as a passive exercise, how can we use dreams to actively train and strengthen our ability to hold focus and intent in our waking state? Well, it will go either way. You see, in both cases, it's the same consciousness, whether you're a dream or awake, it's the same consciousness. And it's just playing in two different data streams. Okay, the dream is another data stream, and it has its own rule set. It's another virtual reality. You get to make choices there and evolve and de-evolve according to those choices. And then you get in this virtual reality we call our physical universe. You get to you know, make choices, and you evolve or de-evolve according to choices. There's nothing really fundamentally different about either state. There's just two different virtual realities. And because it's one consciousness, you can work that both ways. You can hear, say... A lot of people who don't remember dreams, they can start having intent. I want to remember my dreams. I want to remember my dreams. Or people who want to get lucid dreams, they'll go to they'll go to bed with an intent. I want to, you know, wake up in my, you know, it, they they kind of program the intent. Or even people who want to wake up at six o'clock in the morning and there's no alarm clock, you can program your mind. I want to wake up at six. I need to wake up at six. And if you program that with enough intent. You'll wake up at six, six o'clock, your eyes will pop open or you'll get your lucid dream or you'll start remembering your dreams. So you can program in this reality and have it affect the dream reality in your sleep. And you can do it vice versa. In a dream reality, you can focus your, in, your intent and have things happen differently in this reality because it's the same consciousness. In either case, what you're doing is you're, you're, you know, you're like programming by programming. I mean, going over and over and over again, you know, making a lot of emphasis on a particular thing. You're putting that emphasis into your consciousness. So that's the same consciousness that's playing in both virtual realities. So however, and wherever you put a, uh, an idea, you know, you intensely think about a particular thing that you want to accomplish, whatever reality you do it in, it's going to affect all realities you go in, whether you're out of body, lucid dream, night dream, this reality, because it's all one consciousness doing it. So you're, you know, that's what you're doing. You're, you're changing the focus of that consciousness and that change in focus will then reflect itself in all the realities that that consciousness plays in. What the virtual reality of the dream state, because it tends to be a little bit more of a less restrictive rule set, yes. can you practice your, I think that's what the question was sort of pointing to was, can you strengthen your ability to focus your intent in that altered state a little bit easier versus this state? Well, kind of yes and no. I mean, you get, you get results back. You get encouragement much better when you're in a, you know, when you're not in a non-physical state, whether it's dream or out of body or whatever. And an out of body is sort of like dream, except you never lose consciousness. You always, it's a continuous consciousness. But when you're in some other reality frame other than this one, okay, and the rule set is less, let's say, you get instant results. You can manifest things quickly. So if you're in an out-of-body state, you can say, mm, I'd really love uh, to taste a cherry vanilla ice cream cone. Poof, there one is in your hand, and you can lick it, and it will taste delicious, just, you know, the best one you'd ever had. And that manifestation is just that quick. Here in this physical reality, eh, not, not going to work like that. You know, you're not going to just be able to manifest things that way. It's a lot harder here because we have a rule set to deal with. Things have to happen according to a rule set. So there the rule set's looser and you can do that. So in as much as doing your exercises in the non-physical space will give you feedback and encouragement because you know, it, it, there's not much feedback here trying to make an ice cream cone appear in your hand, right? Because it just never happens and it never happens. So you give up and you go away. Well, where, where it does happen, it gives you encouragement. It gives you encouragement to, to do it and to work at it. And yes, the things you work at anywhere will help that consciousness do those same things every place else. It's the consciousness that you're working on. You're, you're the same consciousness no matter what reality frame you're in. Now, you can use your 
your mind, you know, I thought this is where you were going in the beginning, that you could use your intent in a dream state or in an out-of-body state or just in a meditation state in order to impart information here to affect things here. In that, in that uh, let's just call it a meditation state, whether it's dream or out of body or whatever, it doesn't matter. But you get in a meditation state where now you're not in this physical reality. You let go of it. Okay, You're at point consciousness. You can use that intent to communicate with people who are here. You know, you can, uh, and they will get the communication. You now they may or may not accept it. And, uh, you know, you, if you say things that are annoying, you know, they may turn it off or whatever, but you, you can connect with people and you can set intents for things to happen here, just like you can anyplace else. So you can set an intent that, you know, uh, next week when we have the big picnic, it's going to be sunny. You see, that's an intent. And whether you do that from the dream reality or do that from this reality doesn't make any difference. An intention and an intention. Your consciousness, you're in the conscious system. Your intention modifies future probability of whatever system you're talking about. Or if you're in this system, you can, you can uh, intend things that would affect the way your dream reality was in the, in the future. So it's all... In other words, it's, a, it's like a, a real simple idea of what you're doing. And since it's one consciousness, it can do it anywhere. And as long as what's affecting it, what's being affected is the consciousness, then that consciousness experiences that everywhere it goes because the conscious takes with it its, you know, its own, you know, well, I don't know, you, you see what I mean. The consciousness is, has the same uh, kind of the attributes or whatever it is it's trying to do. It can do that everywhere. So yes, practicing in a dream can affect what you do here. Practicing in a, in a daydream can affect what you do here. And many people do that. Many people who are not used to giving speeches in front of a lot of people will spend a lot of time practicing that speech, delivering it. And indeed, they imagine an audience. They imagine they walk up to the stage. They imagine they have a view graph and the first view graph comes on. They point to it and they go through the whole thing while they're sitting there actually looking at a piece of paper, you know, that has the slides on it. And they have the sense that there's an audience that, uh, you know, they have to say things well. They can't stammer around and search for words and it has to be fluent. And uh, they practice that and practice that. Well, that's a daydream. You know, they're, they're in another reality frame. They've let this one go. They let this physical one go. Or they're in this daydream reality. They can practice that speech. And does that help? Absolutely. It helps a lot. If you do that a hundred times, you'll get up there and it'll be easy because you've done it a hundred times before. And it, uh, you know, so you can program things like that. So night dreams, day dreams, out of bodies, it doesn't matter. What you're doing is teaching consciousness. You're learning within the consciousness. You're changing the way you, your perspective inside of consciousness. And that perspective, once changed, is good everywhere. So you'll be, you can give better speeches in your dream because you give speeches here and vice versa. <laughs> you see? Yes. So yes, that's, because, that's the way it works. And it is easier sometimes in a dream because you can do things and interact with people in ways that you can't hear. So it gives you a, a, you know, a larger set of things that you can do there because there's very few restrictions. So in that sense, it could be a, an advantage to use the dream reality, but the daydream reality will work as well. If you can do a good daydream. Now I'm thinking of a daydream is where you are in a meditation state. See, that's sort of, that's sort of a daydream where you let go of this reality and your mind is somewhere else doing some other thing. Well, that's, that's, you know, you're not in this reality anymore. You're in that reality in a, in a hall and there's a thousand, you know, a hundred people out there in your audience and you're giving a speech. Well, that's, that's more effective than if you know you're sitting in your room at your desk holding a bunch of pieces of paper and going through it. So you don't learn nearly as much that way. No, no. I mean, naturally do this. I mean, kids naturally sure. do this, you know, whether it's daydreaming or, or having an imaginary friend or what have you. I mean, it's just something that I think we're programmed naturally to use these altered yes, states. Absolutely. We are multidimensional beings. We, we get, there's all sorts of data streams that we can attach to and data that we can create. And 
we kind of talk ourselves into being a very, uh, you know, unidimensional, you know, by being just in this reality, you know, nothing else is real. Everything else is, you know, isn't useful. And uh, that's a shame because we can function in a lot of different reality frames and eventually we can learn to function in them in parallel. We can do them at the same time. We don't even have to do them serially. We can, we can do several at once. You know, children are like that when they have an imaginary friend. It's not like they drop out of this reality. They're still playing hopscotch with a physical chalk and a physical blacktop and a physical board and their bodies and everything. They're just playing it with an invisible friend. So that's, that's, you know, parallel processing two realities at once. It's not that hard to do. It just takes, it just takes a little practice. It's, it's just not that hard. And the thing is that People don't realize they think that, well, there's this real reality and the rest of them are fake realities. And they're really not, you know, it's just something we make up. It's our imagination. Our imagination is a very powerful thing. It's not just our imagination. You know, it's our thoughts. We make choices. And if we make choices in a daydream or we make choices in a night dream or we make choices in this reality or we make choices in the outer body, they're choices. And we evolve and de-evolve on the basis of those choices, period. And, you know, so you daydream about that thing you'd like to do with that girl, you know, and that's making choices. And that'll help you evolve or de-evolve just as much as if you tried to do that in this physical reality or in a dream or anyplace else. You make choices, you evolve or de-evolve by the quality of the choice. And that's, so all these realities are basically the same. They're just different. They have different rule sets, different things you can do, different kinds of feedback, different consequences for the things you do. Like that's what's nifty about a dream reality. There's no consequences. So it all just, you just wake up in the morning and it all is gone. You, you don't have consequences, but there are consequences. You made choices and the choices and the choices you made have the same consequences no matter where you make them. It's not like dream choices don't count. They're your choices and they count as much as any choice anywhere. It's consciousness making choices because it's getting a data stream, and data streams a data stream. And I've learned that if I if I wake up, if a dream wakes me up in the middle of the night, I've gotten into the habit now of asking the question, "What am I supposed to learn from that?" Versus before it was just, "Well, let's just try to get back to sleep," and that was just a dream. Mm -hmm. It's it's now the question becomes, "Okay, that woke me up. There was something that kind of tapped me out of that dream. Right. You know, what's where's the fear in that?" Where am I looking at? And almost instantaneously, because I think you're just you're just you're still in that theta phase right. where your brain isn't overly processing. It comes to you. The answer comes to you. The fear just presents itself almost as obvious, and you can kind of go back and play that dream and think, "Oh wow, that person represented this, and right. that sort of atmosphere represented that." And it's interesting how it all just plays out. It does. If you pay attention to these things, you can learn a lot more than if you don't pay attention, and that's true in any school in any schoolhouse that you're that you're in you you learn more if you pay attention well i've learned a lot from this tom and i want to thank you again sir it's been an honor and a pleasure to have you on the podcast you're welcome i hope your listeners uh, got their questions answered and if not we can do it again we can always do this again yeah. great tom yeah there, there, there's never any uh, a lack of questions i find that if i answer one question that creates 10 more yes it, uh, it there's never going to run out of questions i sometimes do just q a for two days where i'll go you know there'll be an audience and we'll just sit down and they'll ask questions for two days and uh, they never run out of questions at the end of the second day they still have as many hands in the air <laughs> and you know still as anxious to get questions answered wasn't the same question they started with but it all just builds, and that's good. That's and you never get people, tired of answering them either, do you? No, you know, because that's the way people have to learn. You know, they don't learn by me telling them something. They learn by themselves figuring something out, by their own experience is where they learn. So lecturing is almost useless as far as trying to, you know, have somebody listen to it and grow up. That doesn't happen. You have to experience it. It has to be yours. You know, you have to own it, not just listen to somebody else tell you if it's somebody else talking to you you can either believe it or disbelieve it but you can't own it it's not it's not yours not your truth so that's not useful so answering people's questions it's just where every person is and uh, if you're going to be helpful then you have to answer that question in a way that they can use it and even if you've already answered that question four or five hundred times that's different 
this is a different person. This person needs to get that answer in order to take the next step, you see. And uh, that's just the way it is. So, no, I never, I never really get tired of answering questions because I know that's the only thing that people can use, you know, to grow or to, to go anywhere is to get those, those questions tend to be the things that stop you. Oh, I kind of get this, except uh, that's a problem. I don't get that. How could that be like that? You see, now, now you can't get by that. You know, that's a sticking point. Well, if that doesn't work, then maybe none of the rest of it works either. Yeah. So you kind of can't go on now until that gets resolved. So it's important to answer people's questions. And yes, I do answer the same question hundreds of times. <laughs> but it's always, you know, it's always the first time for that individual that's asking it. And it's always just as important that time as it was any of the other times. So it's, I just don't find it a problem. I don't mind it. I don't mind at all. As long as the people asking it are thinking about it, taking something away and learning, that's, that's my reward. Not, you know, whether I've answered it before or not is whether or not the answer actually helps somebody. Well, we appreciate it, Tom. And, and we love you for doing this. Well, Thank you, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to do this because this is what I do. And people like you give me an opportunity to uh, you know, interact with, with other people, new audiences, new places, with new questions. And uh, I always say things, even if I'm going over similar material, I say it in different ways. And under, you know, getting it has a lot to do with the way you say it. Mm. You say it this way. And some people get it and some people don't. And then right. you say it a different way and the different people will get it <laughs> and others don't. So to say it 10 different ways is not just redundant. It really is helpful to people to hear things in a different context and in a different way. And one, they'll say, ah, I get it. It clicks. And all the rest of them, they maybe heard it 100 times, but it never clicked for them until they heard it that time in that way. So it's I don't. I have a problem with redundancy. I think redundancy is necessary and it's just the way people learn. You know, when you're talking to, you know, a hundred thousand people all at once, you're going to have to do a lot of redundancy because you have to answer each one. And even the, even in a, in a talk, I'll answer a question one way. And that same question will be asked three more times, you know, before I'm, before I'm done, but it's from a different viewpoint, a different perspective, even though it's the same question. So it's what I do. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity. It shows. I mean, it speaks to the, that, that, that aspect of having a passion for what you do when you, when you can repeatedly say it, but from different perspectives and still sort of own that information and, and enjoy giving it out. I mean, that speaks to you know what you're passionate about and what your calling is and what your path is. And, and I think each one of us have that in us, have that seed of what are we passionate about speaking to and and for. And if we can bring that out of us on a repetitive basis, that's really practicing and becoming who we need to be as well. And it comes with repetition. Sure. sure. Yeah, people will sometimes say, well, time because I when I give talks, often I stand up. So I may stand up for three days, you know, and talk eight hours a day for three days. And people will say, how do you do that? You know, I'm sitting in a chair and, you know, I get tired. You know, how do you stand up? Well, it's because it's not work for me. I'm not working. I'm having fun. Yes. You know, I, I'm, I'm doing my passion, as you say, you know, I'm not working. And when you're not working and you're having fun, well, you're not leaking energy. You're gathering energy, you know. You feel you get at the end of it and it's not like, oh, man, let me go lie down and go to sleep. You're wired. You're ready to go. You're still bright eyed and bushy tailed because you've been getting all of this energy out of the situation of doing what you really want to do and what you think is important. So it's not work. So that's why if I had to work, if I was up there working, I wouldn't probably get through the first eight hours before I needed to go sit down. But uh, it's different. That's why when you go to work and you're just turning a crank on a job, but you don't really want to be there, oh, it takes forever to go from you know eight o'clock till five o'clock. It's just like, oh, will it ever come? But when you're out doing your hobby, when you're out you know playing with your kids or doing that kind of stuff, that same amount of time can go by, and it's like, where'd the time go? And nobody gets tired, even though you've been running around and doing all sorts of things. Your body may feel tired, but in your mind, you're still alert and and uh, everything's good. So. 
that's just the way it is. You you gain energy when you do things you care about, and you lose it when you spend your time doing things you don't care about. Yes, one major distinction. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, it's been fun, John. And we'll do this again sometime soon. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see you next time. We'll see you next time. Take care. Tom.